Good morning, social class. Um, happy Monday. Um, per the request of a few students, I have decided to do a very short lecture on um, this week's material. So the first lecture I'm going to do today is on sex and sexuality. Um, most of the content that I'm going to cover is out of your textbook with a few additional things just from my experiences of being a counselor. But today's lecture I'm going to try to keep to under 10 minutes. So this is your quick and dirty review and the things that you will need to know for this week's discussion and essay assignment and for a few questions that you'll see on the midterm that is due by the end of the week. So in the book we are talking about sexuality and sex can be defined in two ways. One, it can be described as a biological construct, so something that you are born with that has to do with your gender. Um, most likely attached to your primary sex characteristics, which would be um, whether or not you have the X or the Y chromosome and whether or not you are showing genitals of a female or male. And the other um, aspect of that is secondary sex characteristics. So that would be the things that develop as a result of you having that chromosome or those genitals. Um, that would be where we hear um, deep voices for men, um, we would see facial hair, um, we would develop breasts and hips as women. So we can break sex down into sex because of primary and secondary sex characteristics, and we can also look at sex as a verb or a thing we do, an activity. Um, and there are two ideas behind that as well. Um, the dichotomy there is that sex as an activity can either be for purposes of reproduction or for pleasure. Um, most people define sex as a activity that leads to reproduction that may have a side effect of pleasure. Um, may being the key word, because we all know there are instances in life when sex does not have a pleasurable outcome. And we'll talk about some of those a little bit later. Um, however, both definitions of sex are definitely defined by the culture that you live in, um, and more specifically, the home that you're brought up in as well. Um, today we're going to talk about some of the history of sex, but also some of the social problems that are linked to the idea of sex and sexuality. It's no secret that um, societies on sex have changed throughout history. Um, in the colonial age, sex was mainly seen as just for reproduction. It was not seen as something to take pleasure in, and if you did take pleasure in it, then you were considered a sinner. Um, consequently, anytime you had sex outside of the marriage, um, it was most definitely a sin. Um, when the Industrial Revolution came and we started moving into cities and people were no longer in small villages and close to their families, they started to have sex outside of the bounds of marriage, um, which caused a lot of internal conflict with people um, and also caused a lot of conflicts within families. And you see at the start of the Industrial Revolution a lot of children being born out of wedlock as well, which is something that was pretty new for our society. Um, and today I'm talking in terms of the U.S. mainly. Um, uh, there was kind of a sexual revolution at the turn of the century as well because people started being able to control birth, not by birth control methods that we know today like um, uh, intrauterine devices or by birth control pills um, or patches or shots, um, but by people simply doing things like using prophylactics, condom, um, and other methods that aren't always effective, like the pullout. Um, then as time went on, there were some more changes. Um, the Roaring Twenties came along. Um, there were war movements in the 30s, 40s. And then when you hit the 50s and 60s, there was a shift to this idea of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, so that led to a lot of changes in sexual behavior as well. Um, I'm sure you guys all remember um, Forrest Gump. If you've not seen it, I'm sure you have. Um, when they show Elvis Presley on the screen dancing and gyrating his hips, um, people were worried that that was going to spur sexual feelings in people as if they weren't already there. Um, in 1940s, in the late 1940s, um, there was a um, professor, Kinsey, um, who started a sexual institute at Indiana University here in uh, Indiana, where I'm employed. Um, and he started doing research on sex, and that's the first time that sex became talked about in a scientific manner. Now, we know that there are psychologists that talked a lot about sex, like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, um, Alfred Adler. They had mentioned a lot of sex in their theories, but 
not a ton of people in that day and age saw psychologists as scientists. So Dr. Alfred Kinsey, who is a biologist, was one of the first people to actually start discussing sex and drawing people's attention. Um, he also shed light on a lot of taboo sexual behaviors, things that people um, hadn't thought of, like sex not in missionary style. Um, so when people started reading more about that, they started feeling more comfortable um, with expressing their sexuality. So that kind of led to more changes that led on through the 50s and 60s as uh, college students started reading about these things and the idea of sex became less quiet. Um, in the 1960s, the birth control pill was invented, which spurred an even bigger sexual revolution. Um, and we do know that the music and the uh, culture at that time for young people was a little bit more wild than it would have been in the 40s and 50s. Um, However, in the late 70s and early 80s, there was what they called a counter-revolution, which was a conservative call back to pure standards. We need to be moral and remember the family and have sex within marriage and abstain from drugs. Um, now that struggle is still present in the United States, as I'm sure some of you grew up hearing one thing but maybe experiencing the other, um, which sometimes leads to experimentation. So I'm not exactly sure that that was the best way to handle it. Um, either way, neither is right or wrong, um, but both of those aspects show a glimp our, glimpse of our history um, and our sociological foundation as well. So something else they talk about in this chapter is sexual orientation. Um, in the book they say that is a person's romantic and or emotional attraction to another person. What the book doesn't say is that sexual orientation can be binary, which is two, so homo or heterosexual. Or um, it can be plurisexual, meaning you're attracted to more than one gender. So let me break that down again. I'm sorry. It's binary as in monosexual. I'm attracted to one gender. Or plurisexual. I'm attracted to many genders. Um, and then we have our alphabet soup, which the book they talk about some, but not all. Um, so what I know as a counselor is where we are now in society is that we use the LGBTQ. I A P, um, which is the alphabet soup of cisgenderness. Um, L is for lesbian, women who are attracted to women. G is for gay, men who are attracted to men. B is for bisexual, which is folks who are attracted to both men and women. T is for tra transgender, which means the opposite of cisgender, which means I don't identify with one gender, I identify with two, or maybe in a gender that it was not assigned to me at birth. There is Q for queer, also known as questioning. I for intersex, which used to be called hermaphrodite, but it's no longer considered that. That's considered a derogatory term. So intersex means I was born with a certain set of genitals that maybe I don't feel conform to what I truly am. Um, there's asexual, people who do not experience pleasure from sex. And pansexual means that you can be attracted to a person's aura or spirit without even considering their gender or their gender identity. Important thing to keep in mind is that people can identify with multiple sexual orientations and multiple gender identities. Um, Most people stick with the LGBTQ and they leave the Q as queer, questioning, and all others. So sometimes you'll just hear that shortened version and that would include your intersex, your asexual, your pansexual people as well. Um, the history of homosexuality is going to show up in this week's homework. So just to kind of give you a brief idea of that, in the 1970s, about 75% of the population thought homosexuality was wrong. But in the like, 2014, the last time that a poll was given, um, that was reduced to 40%. And now that we are in 2018, um, I'm curious to see how much lower that number has gone. Um, in 2004, the very first state to legalize same-sex marriage was Massachusetts, and then other states jumped on board. In 2014 and 2015, um, the Supreme Court basically forced some states to jump on board as well. So, um, has the idea of accepting same-sex partnership become normal yet? Maybe, in some parts of the United States. However, in other parts, it's still frowned upon, and I'm sure there are even folks in our online classroom who have mixed feelings about the situation as well. Similar to other social problems we've discussed, um, racism, sexism, ageism, 
while we've made strides in society to give rights to those marginalized populations um, because they deserve those rights, because they're humans like the rest of us, um, social ideas still interfere with the way that they're treated and the way that um, regulations go about. Um, there are still people who face harassment um, despite of the rights that we try to give them. Um, a good example of this is in the state of Indiana, where I live. We have the RIFRA law, which is the Religious Freedom Rights Act, which means that a business owner can decline service to anyone based on their religious beliefs. Um, so even though homosexuals can get married here, um, they might not be able to get a wedding cake here um, if all the vendors decide to not give them a cake. I'm already over 10 minutes and I'm only halfway through the material, so I'm going to try to speed through this a little bit faster, get better at this for you. Um, so some of the origins of sexual uh, orientation are cultural. So some cultures, they um, do have men that dress and act as women. Um, that's not something you normally see in the United States, um, but it is something to remember. And there are several um, cultures around the world that don't believe in binary genders. So they don't believe in male and female. They believe that those lines can be intermixed and that you can feel as though you're both. Um, so that is something to keep in mind and that's how those people were raised and brought up. Um, so it's not necessarily wrong. It might just be not something you're used to. Um, there's also biological factors that make us different as, as genders. Um, a lot of times the, the hypothalamus is a region of the brain that is connected to sexuality. Um, and it tends to um, differ with um, men and women, and then also with gay men and gay women. Um, gay men's hypothalamus, um, the way they operate and structure and light up when certain um, things are thought of or spoken of, is very similar to um, homosexual females when they are spoken to as well. So that's pretty interesting. Um, also genetics, um, they have found some genetic markers that they believe may indicate somebody um, being homosexual or um, wanting to identify in something other than heterosexual. Um, and then there's also the idea of epigenetics, which is, to, to put simply, is um, the way that your genetic makeup can be altered when you're in the womb, depending on what the mom does um, to her body. So there are things that we think can be done prenatally to affect the outcome of people um, and how they feel about gender and sexual identity. Um, and I want to point out too that social science has often got this wrong as well. Up until the 70s, the, um, the APA Manual of Disorders, so the DSM Diagnostic Manual, um, which helped people decide if you were schizophrenic or bipolar um, or had an eating disorder, also had homosexuality listed in it as a um, psychological disorder or dysfunction. So even social science hasn't gotten it right. Um, so some of the sexual issues and controversies that they discuss in your book, um, I don't necessarily like that they came right after we talked about the different types of genders um, and gender identities and sexual identities and sexual orientations, but nevertheless, they are social problems that are a result of sexuality, are pornography, sexual harassment, prostitution, um, teenage pregnancy, abortion, and STDs. So whereas you might not necessarily think abortion is a social problem, um, because there's so much debate over whether or not it is right or wrong, it is a social issue. So that's why we talk about these things in the book. Um, the same thing with pornography. Um, there have been studies that show that it does not incite violence in people, but there are studies that have conversely shown it does. So once again, it's a social issue because we can't necessarily say one way is right or one way is wrong. There are some things you might think are absolutely wrong, like prostitution, um, but seeing as though it is the oldest career or profession in the world, um, it's not always viewed as a negative thing in all cultures. cultures. So I want to wrap up because I'm already at a 15 minute lecture and I didn't intend to be this long. Um, I'm talking about probably the more complex issue in our book, which we always end each chapter with discussing the sociological um, theories and how they relate to the topic at hand. So with sexuality, there's three, there's three theories that we talk about. The first is the structural functional analysis. Um, and this tends to be what most conservatives identify with. 
And this is the idea that sex is a way of reproducing. It's also a way of keeping family units together. Um, so if there was incest, that would be bad because those family lines would be blurred. Um, but also um, things like having sex before marriage could cause family lines to be off. Um, and the whole idea behind the structural functional and the way that the conservatives see it is to protect the family unit um, and to create and maintain that unit so that we know who's inheriting what and whose family line goes back this way or that way. Um, so it's very much about drawing the lines in the sand. Um, interestingly enough, in the book, though, they do talk about the function of prostitution. And sometimes the people who are theorists in this genre um, think that prostitution um, actually serves a purpose to um, keep people from staying uh, too far outside the lines. Um, so they believe it's a fundamental part of society and it's necessary. Different, huh? Didn't expect that. Um, the other uh, theory is the symbolic interaction theory. Um, this is a more liberal idea. Um, this is where we think of sex as socially constructed. So my ideas about sex, my ideas about gender are um, created through my interactions with the world and how I feel and believe when I'm interacting with people. Um, and this line of theory also thinks that you can have sex changes, gender identity changes. Um, your history of sex can change over time because of the way that culture moves very fluid. So um, again, a more liberal viewpoint. In this viewpoint, they also believe that people can develop their own norms for what sexual um, activity can look like. So um, this might be, you know, you decide on yourself what you're comfortable with in your own marriage or in your own life. Um, or you decide for yourself how you feel about um, someone who might not identify as the same sexual orientation as you. The last theory is the social conflict analysis theory, and this tends to be where our radical folks come in, our radical left. Um, and there was two theories they discussed in the book, the feminist theory, which believes that the United States and most of the world is set up as a patriarchy and um, very much believes that if we don't have a gender-free society, then it will always be a place where men are empowered above women and women will always be the bottom hand, so we will always be prostitutes, we'll always be... Um, you know, starring in pornography, um, and just the way that the system is set up. Um, those people believe that, that women will never rise up to be equal as men because of the way that society has treated pornography, sexual harassment, et cetera, until those things are completely abolished, um, and then we can be seen as equals. So the other theory is the queer theory, and it's very similar, um, but it's more about the um, homosexual um, homosexuals don't feel as though they fit into our society because we're a very heterosexist society, um, which means that until we eliminate those lines between heterosexuality and homosexuality being right or wrong, then nobody's going to be able to feel free to participate in the sex that they want to participate in. Um, so radical left, gender-free society, conservatives, Moral principles should guide the way you feel about sex and the way that you keep your family unit lined up, established. And then you have your liberals, which believe that sexuality is fluid and can be a choice and can change over time. So that's kind of the quick and dirty, way over 10 minutes. Totally didn't make that happen. Um, but I wanted to give you a video lecture um, just so that some of you who are maybe oral or visual learners can um, understand a little bit more about what we're talking about this week. I didn't go into great detail about sexual disorders, um, things like gonorrhea and syphilis, which can be cured, herpes, which cannot be cured, HIV and AIDS, which can also not be cured at this time, but can be treated. Um, but those are in your book as well, as are the different types of harassment, which you will see. Um, the one harassment that I do want to mention is quid pro quo, which means this for that, or tit for tat, if you've heard that. Um, so if somebody asks you to do something to get a raise, to give a sexual favor, to give a raise in your job, or uh, just as, you know, if you do something for me, then I'll give you money, um, that is a type of sexual harassment called quid pro quo. You will need to know that this week on your midterm. So um, thanks for tuning in and watching. If you tolerated all 20 minutes, um, I will be getting another video on here shortly about um, drug use, drug abuse and how our society views the social problems associated with drugs. Thank you so much. Have a happy Monday.